So my name's John Heath. I'm the lead mechanical design engineer in the recently formed special projects team at, at Brompton Bicycles. Um, for those who don't know, we're based in West London, Greenford, um, and we've been there since around 1975 when the company was started. So this bicycle is um, a Bickerton folding bicycle. So in 1975, our founder, um, Andrew Ritchie, discovered this bicycle. Um, as an engineer himself, liked the concept of a folding bicycle, but didn't like a lot of the engineering detail and felt that he could do it a lot, lot better. So fast forward on a couple of years with a little bit of work in his, in his flat um, with no great tools uh, and special expertise, he put together his first prototype, which starts to form the, the beginnings of the Brompton Bicycle, and was certainly the, the foundation of the Brompton Bicycle Company. Fast, fast forward on um, another five years, and you start to see the form of the first Brompton Bicycle. Um, this was the very beginning. We were struggling. He was making a, f a handful of bicycles, selling them locally in London. Um, tried to sell the concept to Rally, who decided not to take the idea. Um, also struggled with a few big banks for financing. Um, that was very much in the in the early days. And he dedicated a lot of his a lot of in fact all of his all of his time. That that was that was his his life really for the next um, decade or two, um, going into the late 80s and early 90s. So over that period, the, 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 burn, the burn rate for the development was relatively slow. So, so a lot of the focus was on how do we take this folding bicycle that, that, that works very well as a bicycle um, and as a commuter package and, and start to mass produce it. So the design didn't change, but understanding how we mass produce this bike um, was a lot of the, the, the background work that happened. Um, Going into the late 90s, you can't really see too many changes. So, so small increments, again, all happening in the background, mass produce, being able to mass produce this bike and bring us up to our current output, which is around 200 bicycles a, a day. This is kind of where we are now. So still small incremental changes, um, but we're producing more special edition bicycles. So if I move on to the next slide, what you'll see here is the factory back in the early 80s, which is really more of a workshop, so producing a, a handful of bicycles a, a week um, with, with many issues that they were trying to resolve, on, uh, Andrew was trying to resolve on a daily basis. So the bicycles were produced from raw material, so each of the frames are individually brazed as, as they are today, um, hand brazed. Then put through the assembly line. So then fast, forward, fast forwarding to today, we have two assembly lines. We still hand raise every single frame. Um, we have our own wheel building line. So, so we, we take rims, spokes, hubs, we build our, build our own wheels. And the reason we do this is because we have about three million different bicycle variants if you start taking the colors, the gears, mud guides, no mud guides, different handlebar heights. So we need the flexibility to have different gears, to have um, dynamos, etc., on the wheels. We also have our own paint line. So we're a full manufacturing facility from raw material to final product. So that, that's a little bit of background about Brompton. It is relevant because it puts in context where we are today with the development of the, of the product. So up to this point, the design's been, design development's been conservative. We have one product. Um, that's what keeps our company running. That's what keeps it alive. We have lots of different variants, but ultimately one product. So we dare not develop rapidly because if we predominantly because we've built a reputation for a, a, a reliable, robust, recognized um, product. And we, we don't want to start messing with that formula that works really, really well. Um, so what we have, our design team, we only have 12, 12, 12 design engineers. So, so for the size of the company, there's about 300 employees. Most of our IP is based 
around the um, tooling for the, for the production of our product, not the product itself. Patents have long expired. Um, many companies have tried to copy it. They copy the concept, they copy the folding mechanism, but it, it's very difficult to get right in production. One or two, maybe, but to try and produce that um, at the rate of 200 bicycles a day is, is extremely challenging. So design development, there's 12 engineers. We're split across three core teams. So tooling is really important for us. So our tooling design, which I've just mentioned. Um, core bike continuous development is, is still important. So small increments on the current bike, fixing design issues in, in, in production, field-related design issues, uh, and, and our special edition products uh, are extremely valuable to us. And the team I head up is the special projects. So, so we're, as a company now, in a position where we have enough resource that we can start to develop offline from the core bike, which is exciting. So, so we can start to develop new concepts, new ideas, without risking our, 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 our main revenue stream, which is, is, is the bike that we're producing. And the split across really is, for, is from mechanical to industrial designers. So, so we have industrial designers and we have pure mechanical engineers and pretty much everyone in between at different um, disciplines of, of product designers. But what we don't have is, is dedicated CA engineers. So I've come from companies where we had the fortune of having 30 CA, CA engineers um, dedicated to drop test analysis, dynamic analysis, um, whatever the design engineer might want, might want, but we don't have that luxury. So we have to have that resource shared amongst the, uh, amongst the engineers. So how do we develop? It, it, it's very, very basic pretty much like every other um, product development company. We develop our concept, we prototype. Generally, uh, we have a workshop, so we build models. We test on, test on our bench, we have a, t uh, a test lab. We incrementally, incrementally improve that and repeat. And then finally, once we have a design solution, maybe over our development cycle could be, could be anything from two to four years, so relatively slow. And then we validate the, those through uh, ISO tests. We have to pass a bike safety standard 4210 um, to be able to sell our product. So traditionally, we develop conservatively. Uh, and that's why the evolution of the bike really hasn't changed over, over these decades. This is an example of a brake lever which was developed in the last four years. So we evolved the, the, the design of the brake lever to increase the um, efficiency to improve the aesthetics and the challenge as well is is to maintain the the piece part price of that as well where we've we've optimized the design from a production point of view but also from a costing point of view as well which makes future developments very difficult we've we've developed engineering wise lots of great solutions but from a cost point of view they're very difficult to justify the implementation onto onto the product so the brake system was redesigned to the, the, the lever and the caliper, but again, through quite traditional methods. So we were producing rapid prototypes, CNCing from um, the um, correct materials for, for our trials. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a slow, it's a slow development process. And this, this project was almost three and a half years, which is a little bit ridiculous for, for a brake lever system design like this. We want to change that. So, so about a year and a half ago, when I, when I started at Brompton, I, I brought my simulation experience uh, and, and tried to change the development process a little bit to make the designers own simulation as a tool. So they might go to the workshop, they, they may use CAD, um, but simulation should be, see, should be seen really as an additional tool for the development process. And historically, it's been seen as a little bit difficult to use. It's been seen as a separate department, so an over-the-wall mentality. But with a lot of, certainly a lot of modern CAE tools, it makes them far more accessible. That doesn't mean that the engineers don't need to understand the fundamentals of CAE, um, the, the fundamentals of FEA, 
but it certainly makes the tools more accessible to, to be able to um, include in the development process. So I've just added simulate after every one of those phases, but that's, that's true. It's from the very concept, we, we want to be able to use the simulation tool just, just to understand is that concept worth um, pursuing. And, and often the design engineers might be very conservative and cautious to develop an idea because the cost and the time, um, there's time pressures, pressures to put products into production. So they'll take more risks. So with a simulation tool, they'll take more risks. They may, they may at the end of the day, they may try out, try out a different design. Doesn't work, they can bury it, fine, they can move on, but they're, they're learning from that, that, that mistake um, without too many time constraints. So what type of simulation do we do at Brompton? Um, relatively simple, I like to keep it simple. We don't have huge computing power, so we want to run most of these simulations on our laptops. So linear, linear static and a little fatigue. Um, but we can do full frames, so we, we just simply use shell elements, or even I've been working on some simple beam elements. So rolling back to the 1960s philosophy of, of keep the models very simple to start with in concept phase, and then build the resolution of those models as the, as the development progresses. So this push and prod approach is, is taking the, the, the idea, of, uh, taking the design from the CAD, lifting it into FE, and just being able to have it in your hands almost to understand um, it's not a static, rigid model existing in CAD. It does move and shift and, and is a dynamic system. And it's getting the design engineers thinking a little bit differently about their, their designs. And we're progressing a little bit onto motion and um, MBD and, and some optimization as well. The key driver to a lot of this is the bicy our bicycles are great, they're a little bit heavy. We want to light weight, and, that, and that's um, what we're trying to, um, certainly what I'm trying to drive in the special projects team is light weighting um, with the optimization on, on part structure um, and stiffness. So again, just to talk about integrating FE into the design process, keeping it simple, setups. Uh, set up, setting up the models relatively simple and um, changing the mindset. So it's a simulation-driven uh, 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 design approach. So this is one of the first projects I was involved in was, it, it, well, I was driving, was to take the existing uh, bicycle uh, and build an FE model of it, which seems pretty obvious. But when I joined, there was no FE model of the existing bike, which is it's beautiful, really, because we can take a product that's been out in the field for so long, and we can make, produce an FE model of that and begin to gi digitally map the stiffness and ride characteristics to, to develop a, a digital baseline of, of what we have today. So this is, this is a, just a, a brief demo in, in Altair Inspire of um, quite a simple, quick FE analysis of the, the, the seat post tube. So validation of the model. We, we've, we've got a series of tests that we take um, on the current frame that define the right characteristics of the bicycle. This is something we've developed, but it's something that's based around the bicycle industry. And it, it defines things like the steering position of the bicycle. So when you get on a bike and you ride it down the road, it's a very complex dynamic model, and to try and break that down and map those is really very challenging. So we, we've got about eight different tests that we use to characterize the, the bicycle frame. So we've done that in the lab, but we've also replicate and replicated that and validated that with, the, um, with our FE software. So moving on to optimization, this is the Chain tensioner, so on our bicycles, when you fold it, you have to prevent the chain from going slack, so we have a, um, a torsion spring-loaded um, plastic arm that has never really been optimized at all for, for stiffness and weight, so that's another example of a piece of work that we've, we've been doing to, to um, refine that. Again, improving the, improving the um, part design, but at the same time, improving it through simulation. So previously, we were just cross hatch ribs on the back, um, maybe 10 years ago when there was no understanding about the, the, 
the, the stiffness of a product through its, through its loadings. So this shows the original design, just a simple crosshatch on the back, creating a design space, um, and then from the optimization tool, we, we get a, 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 an idea of where we want to add material to give the, the, the part its stiffness. And then finally, we, we optimize that for, for production, which is uh, an injection molded part. So one and a half times stiffness increase, reducing peak stress by around 30%. So when you start to get these figures and you start to get this, this feedback going back to design engineers, they can actually see they're refining their design in an in, in intelligent way, rather than blindly adding ribs in because that's where they think they're adding stiffness. Actually, it might be increasing the stress or um, adding stiffness in a way that is not really helping the function of the product. Uh, the part, sorry. This was a, a demonstration where we have the rear dropout transition from the main frame to the rear frame. We, we, we started just that, block that out and, and have a look at where, for our multiple load cases, we, we expect, expect to see uh, material um, and where the key load paths were to start to rethink some of the, some of the design of the, uh, the, the part. Again, in, in Inspire, this is a casting analysis of our, our rear plates. So it's something we're touching on, something we're, we're, we're looking at doing. It's just a, uh, an element to our simulation tool. Again, it's not something we're using uh, every day, but it's just, again, having the awareness of that capability. This is something... Oh. Sorry, I'll, I'll skip past that slide. So, once we have our full bike built, we put it on a rolling road. Uh, we weight up the bike to represent the, the rider, and that generally runs for around um, 48 hours over multiple road surfaces. It's quite a brutal test. Looking at the fatigue of the bicycle, um, we've looked at some multi-body dynamics to try and replicate that. Um, on, uh, in CAE. It's, it's complicated, it's not that simple, um, but it's something we've managed to show some, sort, some type of correlation between the mainframe, certainly on the mainframe area, to the, to the rolling road uh, test. So this is an example of a post-test failure that, that we were finding on uh, a head tube transition where we were looking at Again, the rolling road test you've just seen. And we also have a, a pedal fatigue test where we, where we replicate um, pedaling under high loading. And we are finding cracking actually in quite a strange place. You can see the red lines there. Normally the cracking is expected top and bottom of the, of the head tube. But it wasn't really making too much sense. So I, we quickly set up an FE model, maybe took 15, 20 minutes, um, just a, sh a shell um, using simple shell elements linear static model. The beauty was we can just put a th few different random load cases through it, static load cases, and start to look at where we're likely to see, or which load case we're likely to see the stresses that were causing the crack. So further investigation, we found the crack was propagating from a hole that was added inside. The hole was there predominantly for weight saving and also for airflow we needed for the, the welding operation. That hole, although this is exaggerated, the distortion, the hole initially didn't look like it was going to cause a problem. But because of the distortion of the overall tube, it was collapsing the whole, the whole system and causing a crack from the circumference of the hole, which was propagating to the outside, outside edge. So quickly, the simple solution was close the hole. Close the hole, stresses went away. We didn't have to build another prototype. We carried on with the design, mitigated the risk. So that's a, that's a real world example where if we didn't have FE and we didn't have the capability and confidence to use it, Brompton would have built another prototype, we'd have run a series of tests, that would have been at least a month um, to run those and validate those tests to confirm that the removing the hole would have fixed the problem. Although it seems obvious, it seemed initially obvious that the hole wouldn't have caused the problem. So sometimes you just need to have that extra insight into the design and this is what FE is really giving us. 
So, okay, so that, that concludes my presentation. I'm doing a small workshop in the um, Altair room, um, uh, is in Inox 1, on, in the Inox building, level 5. Yes, that's right, um, um, for an hour and a half if anyone wants to come and join us. So I'll go into detail on a little bit more of, the, little bit more of these slides and there'll be some um, presentations from some of the modules in, in Altair Inspire. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.